Hello. Hi. Welcome to session B2. Um, this session is called Learn How to Use Improvement Evidence and Best Practice to Deliver Better Quality Care. Cheer if that's the session you think you're coming to. Congratulations, well done, me too. Um, my name's Helen Morant, I'm Head of Online Learning at BMJ Learning. My voice isn't usually this deep, um, and I hope it'll hold out through the session. Um, I'm, being, I'm going to be chairing the session and uh, presenting a little bit at the beginning and then mediating questions at the end, so um, I shouldn't have to do too much talking because I've got two other co-presenters who I'll introduce in a minute. Just while some people are coming in at the back, welcome to everyone coming in. Uh, we're also being filmed, um, and some people might be watching us live on the internet right now. So if you could just say hello to the internet. Hello, internet! Um, and also, this is going to be recorded so you can come back and watch this session and any other session in the future. So you can say hello to the future. Great. Um, as part of the future, we are also tweeting during this session. So we will be doing questions in your standard way with um, Lizzie and Kate will be coming around with microphones at the end of the session. We'll have a good 15 minutes for questions at the end, we hope. So have your questions ready, but also use Twitter if you're on it and use the app if you're on it to put questions forward to us. Nothing too personal, please, um, but we're really happy to take questions and just generate some discussion about, about this issue that we'll be talking about today. Great. Well, I think we're nearly, we're nearly at full house, so um, I'll kick off. So as I said uh, before, my name's Helen Morant. I'm head of online learning at BMJ Group. Um, and I'm here in that capacity. So my, my, my expertise, I'm a retired anaesthetist um, and now an educationalist working at BMJ. So I have a clinical background and an education background. And later on, Krishna and Peter are going to be bringing their areas of expertise um, from a trainee in um, secondary care perspective and also the primary care perspective. And we think it's really important that all those different perspectives are brought. And yes, we are all English and British and we appreciate um, that a lot of you aren't and so welcome to London um, we're really excited to be on home turf but we're really glad to welcome you all here so if any of your questions relate to how what we're talking about might apply differently in different countries do hold on to those and, and bring them forward at the end so the learning objectives um, we these, these seem quite dense, but essentially we, we, want to, we want you to go away from this session understanding a little bit about how education is important, obviously that's my pet subject, how software um, and new technologies are, are bringing real-time performance improvement. Um, so how, how this sort of technology thing that we're thinking about a bit is sort of leaking into the practice at the point of care and talking about decision support as well and that happening live and in real time. And, and how those things are uh, very important for us to be aware of using properly and sensibly and to the maximum of their capabilities. And then finally, of course, we want to collaborate and learn from each other. And we'll be doing that in the se question session at the end. Um, just to unpick the title a bit, I think um, improvement evidence is a really interesting uh, uh, concept to have a bit of a broader think about. And my role here is really to expand some of these thoughts. Um, we all know about evidence-based medicine, and we all know we should be doing evidence-based medicine, and often we will say we are doing evidence-based medicine, but we, do, we also know that there are limitations to it. And so thinking about what evidence there is for improvement and broadening out the concepts uh, of, of evidence and improvement are, are really important to getting the most out of what we'll be saying. So we're not just talking about what the science says, we're not just talking about small quality improvement projects on a, on a ward-based size, we're talking about combining the, that whole spectrum to, to think about what, what improvement evidence is. Um, best practice, of course, is a hot topic around, uh, certainly around BMJ with our decision support tool, but thinking in, in as broad a concept of what best practice really is. Um, it's about getting the right care to the right people at the right time, 
but also increasingly it's about doing it in a cost effective way isn't it and, and making sure that we're not uh, wasting anything either money or other resources that we could be um, we could be using and better quality care well it's can't get much broader than that um, the the thing I want to sort of, the way I want to frame the rest of this session is in this, the, the uh, concept of how long it takes to get from evidence into practice. And there's this, um, I'm sure it'll be mentioned, it's probably been mentioned already, but it will be mentioned over and over again, this concept of it takes 17 years for a good scientific idea to get into practice. And... Um, and everyone thinks that's too long. Everyone thinks it's insanely long. Um, but I think it's important to break that down and have a really good think about what, that, what how happens during those 17 years. So, oh, this is just our outline for today. I should have gone there first. Sorry. How we know what we should be doing. Uh, an example of science with some difficult implementation and how to make change part of normal practice in primary care. So I'll just crash on with this uh, slide on translational medicine sounds really technical and difficult but this is just talking about the concept of getting the science right and then taking that science all the way through to where it makes a difference and um, I think it's uh, it's Morris and colleagues that I got this diagram from from the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine in 2011 and it's this just explains how Basic research is actually the fundamental of all the things we do. And we have, to, as quality improvement professionals, I think it's important that we're aware that that basic research is important. We can get very um, tied up sometimes, I think, in, in the, the sharp end and, and applying things and thinking about the system we're working in. But we do always need to remember that that basic research needs to be done well. We need to be engaged in what is good science. Um, because un unless we've got that bit right, we don't, um, we, whatever, however well we apply something, it's not going to be the right thing, it's not going to improve outcomes. Um, I think the, uh, the issue that, that Morris and their colleagues looked at in this, um, using this diagram is really interesting because um, they identified that the 17 years that we talk about might be 17 years from the basic research being published to the guideline being published. Um, and I don't know about you, but a lot of the work we do is about implementing guidelines. And producing a guideline might be one, one, one thing to happen, but actually getting that guideline into practice is a whole other um, ball game, and, a whole, and the clock almost could start ticking at that point rather than um, the stage of the initial research. So the other diagram that I like that I think is important in this is from Glasiu from the um, BMJ Quality and Safety Journal in 2011 and this is talking about how we combine evidence-based medicine and um, quality improvement which is what we all know and love um, and I like the way that this uh, concept of good patient care which again we're, we're all passionate about um, combines evidence-based medicine and quality improvement in a really sensible way and that framework of thinking locally think about what works for you in your hospital uh, in your surgery in your um, wherever you happen to be working in your clinic um, and what works what we know to be true globally is something you can apply you can apply across um, quality improvement and evidence-based medicine and thinking about this idea of evidence-based medicine being doing the right thing and quality improvement doing the thing right combining those two doing right things right um, and this is this is the difficulty and of combining all those things together to make sure that every step of that is is done properly um, now those are two ways of thinking thinking about things uh, I've got one more which hopefully will load from here which I thought of myself um, so this is uh, I'm just going to go backwards quickly and deconstruct this graph so we can build it again um, this is conceptual and it's to be pulled apart so please think about this in your questions and, and point out where we've, we've got it wrong and not, not thought things through. But I thought what, we're, what we tend to want to do is stop bad things happening. That's what we're fighting against generally. I think we can all agree that bad things are bad. And so this graph is about how, how, how we are aiming to reduce bad things. And as all good graphs have an x-axis of time, so... Um, 
If we look at this is a lovely graph of a classic implementation of an exciting new uh, drug treatment or uh, any other sort of treatment for, for a bad thing, and it makes that bad thing happen less. And I thought it was having, worth having a look at the different events that might be kicking off these things. As I said, this is conceptual. I spent quite a lot of time looking around to see if there was any single case study we could bring together which demonstrated good evidence for all the different stages of this. Um, within a certain population, and there just isn't. So this is, um, an, as I talk through it, try and think of things that might relate to your practice that, that have it. So I've started off here saying one of the things that might uh, bring down the number of these bad things happening might be a, a randomised controlled trial proposing a new treatment and proving that that treatment works. And that's great, and, and bad things happen less. Once a few randomised controlled trials have happened, we can got a guideline and those guidelines um, are things that people might take, pay attention to and that might start to change practice. Uh, if you've got a proactive government, you might get a policy change. Um, uh, the government might bring in some law that helps uh, the bad things happen less and that may have a greater or lesser effect. Um, I've got a dip here, a public health incident. It should probably be a spike because we know that circumstances happen, um, outbreaks happen. Um, they may be as a result of policy or, as we've got in South Wales at the moment, the result of some media events sort of a few years ago. So public health incidents are, are, are things that will affect how, how um, a health outcome uh, how quickly it's uptaken or, or comes about. Professional education is the thing that I'm interested in and, and I, I think is a really important part which can be a really strong driver for um, cutting down on the bad things and of course patient choice is another thing and all of those things have different influences and there are lots more. I think generally speaking we will think of ourselves in the quality arena as being down this end of the graph. Um, and I think there are lots of little things. Uh, once we get to the sharp end, it gets, uh, it gets fragmented. And I think we'll be hopefully talking about a few more of those as we go on. Um, the other thing, these are sort of the big events. But the other things I thought about were things that also influenced. Um, and these just, you've seen these as I brought the graph up. But I've got, I've got three things here which I think are, we should always bear in mind um, uh, thinking about when we're applying things. Corporations, um, and I include in that organisations like pharma companies and like um, big philanthropy organisations which have very um, specified outcomes or objectives that they're looking for for good or ill, um, that may be specific or um, uh, specific to a disease outcome or specific to a financial outcome. But I think it's important to think about how these, how big corporations will be looking at this graph and thinking about where those touch points are. What, what trials should we fund? What guidelines should we try and influence? What, how, what is our role in public health um, and the incidence of those? And, and how can we influence professional education to get involved with those things? The other thing that is important is governments, and again, these are just conceptual lines of where governments might have touch points in these things. And I think it's really important to consider um, that actually politics does have does make a major play in these in these areas. How, if you live in a, an, a country which has uh, uh, ambitious ambitions towards being a very small government and, and lots of a libertarian um, attitude to to health generally, then you're going to have less. Uh, state intervention in producing guidelines, for example, whereas if you live in a socialist country where health is part of the, the government's remit, then you're going to have more. And that's an important uh, consideration to think about when we're, when we're looking at these things. And then, and then we've got what I've called systems, but, you know, is also the culture of the, organ of the country. And I think culture is really important to consider as well. Um, I've, put, I've put things like uh, three words I thought might be worth us thinking about quickly, just choice. I mean, who likes choice? Hands up if you like choice. Yeah, quite a lot of you. Hands up if you don't think choice is that important in healthcare. Yeah. There are, but it's, it's, it's absolutely fine to disagree that you think choice is important in healthcare. I think there are areas where it's not. 
I think it's a difficult thing to say, but whose choice is it? Who's making the decisions? Obviously, patients have an important part to play in that, that thing. What about access? Who thinks everyone should have access to all healthcare? Of course we do, but what do we mean by access? How, how close um, do we want to get to what, what, what our care is? How, what care should we have access to? What is care? These are all big issues that are addressed very differently. Um, rationing. Who thinks rationing is good? No, not many people think rationing is good. In, uh, in the US at the moment, with the healthcare reforms going through there, a lot of uh, smaller, uh, a lot of the, uh, the Republican side think they're calling rationing the death panels. We have rationing in the UK and it's run by something called NICE. You can see there there's a very cultural difference between the, what is essentially in some areas that same concept of things. So I think these it's important that we interrogate the culture in which we're working in and work out what the best way to get the outcomes we want is. So I'm just going to go back to the presentation now. Um, and there's the graph overall. So BMJ Learning is my baby. Just going back to professional education. This is a learning module we've done about stroke. Um, like, like I've done here, we had some learning outcomes. This, this is... Um, an example, e-learning per se is an example of how we can change knowledge quite easily. But we've also done some work recently with the Department of Health, very similar format. You'll see it's still in the same e-learning format. But this is about more about changing not just the knowledge, um, of which there, there's some factual knowledge in this module, but it's much more about trying to change health, healthcare professionals' behaviours and attitudes. And it's really important that we look at those professional attitudes as important things that we want to change as well. Um, I don't know if any of you recognise these things we used to have. They're called books. They're made from paper, uh, which involves cutting down trees. And it's where we used to find information. And it was a laborious process. We had to open them up and look through them and remember where things were. And we'd use things called bookmarks, which are longer bits of paper. Anyway, just a, his, a point from history there. We're now using for exactly the same job retrieving knowledge, things like best practice, which is a cl clinical decision support tool. Um, and I, I am being sarcastic when I talk about books, but I do think it's important that not too far from now, people will be saying those things very honestly and no one will raise a smile because that will be what's going on. And people will look at websites like this and go, yeah, mm, yeah, that's, that's sort of a fairly archaic looking website. I now obviously get the information straight, downloaded straight into my brain from wherever I need it, whenever I need it. Um, so there's just uh, a couple of examples of how professional knowledge and attitudes can be altered. And then um, in terms of behaviour, we've got BMJ quality is something that we've, you might see around, talked about quite a lot at this forum. But it's something that is actually changing behaviours and bringing together the behaviours of doctors who uh, might be looking to do an audit for their revalidation, which is what we have to do in the UK, along with the behaviours of uh, managers who are trying to change the uh, prescribing behaviours of doctors in a system and bringing those teams together in a way that creates projects and creates a knowledge base that people can share. And so changing those, the, that knowledge and behaviour is an important thing. Um, yeah, quick, quick break. I think, uh, okay. What are these? Okay, one last time. These are small, but the ones out there are far away. <laughs> Small, far away. <laughs> I forget it. That was from a sitcom called Father Ted, which you may or may not have seen. Um, and if you're wondering why it's in there, I wanted to get people thinking about our perspective. Um, 
Father Dougal, <laughs> the younger one, does have some problem with perspective, doesn't quite understand about some cows being small and some cows being far away. And I think it's very easy for us to be a little bit like that in the situation we're working in. We know that um, we're working in a system like a hospital or a ward or a GP surgery or in any other environment, a remote clinic, and that's our system and that's our perspective. But from a... An, and if you're working in government, your perspective is much bigger on a public health level. Um, but if you're actually the person who's ill and interacting with that system, you've got all these things going on um, that are important for you. Um, and so patients and the information patients get is really important. And I just wanted to sort of talk again about the sort of big thinking in terms of the events that happen. Patients um, have big events in their lives, and those events might be things like diagnosis, and they might be things like treatment, uh, going into hospital for an operation. Treatment, those are the sort of big events that patients have, and they have big influences. So their health beliefs are a really important part of how, what their outcome is going to be. The circumstances they're in at the moment, these all make a difference to um, how they feel and whether they, are, whether they come out with a good outcome for them. And remember that the good outcome for the patient isn't necessarily the same as the good outcome for the system or the, or the person treating them. And then they also have to make decisions and, and all those things play into those decisions that are made. And this is just an example of a, a shared decision tool that um, we uh, have been working on and are published in the NHS. And, to, and this looks at how you can help patients make decisions by um, taking them through a process. And it's important, I think, to always bear in mind that perspective that we might have and get quite excited about uh, changing some numbers on a graph to, make, to prove that something works. But unless we're deeply engaged with the patient in front of us or, or someone is, then things are going to uh, not, not happen for the right reasons. I'm going to hand over to Krishna now, who's going to uh, talk about stroke. Okay, so thanks, Helen. Um, you may have realized that Helen did mention stroke or had slides about stroke, and there is a reason for that. that that's a theme that's running through the... Uh, talk for the uh, for the whole of the session. So my name is Krishna. I'm a neurology fellow, and um, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about acute stroke thrombolysis. So this is a secondary care perspective. And for those who don't know, stroke thrombolysis means treating strokes within the first few hours using clot busting drugs. Um, and I'll talk a bit about the problems with implementation, despite the science. Okay. Uh, so if we start our journey right here, 150 years ago, um, I don't think I've is this a pointer? Nope, that's not a pointer. Um, anyway, if you, if you look at the map and if you look at the Victoria Docks, we're actually right above the Victoria Docks right now. Um, and 150 years ago, this was all marshland. Um, and this famous London writer, um, probably the second most famous writer in England, actually, uh, went down there to have a look at what the area was like. And he said this. Um, he said is a is a dwelling place uh, for people who are already debased below the point of enmity to filth. Um, thankfully, it's all changed now, and you've got a bright, shiny exhibition center here instead. Uh, and that writer was Charles Dickens. Um, sadly, a few years after that, uh, he died in his house. Um, this was an eyewitness account from a friend. Um, he tried to get up and then sank heavily to his left side uh, and then passed out and, and, and died soon after. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about hard times uh, in the next couple of slides, and th that, that's the title of a Charles Dickens novel, but it's not about the novel. It also describes stroke care over the last hundred years or so. Um, stroke is, of course, very common, so one in six men and one in five women will su suffer a stroke in their lifetime. Uh, what may be surprising is that a quarter of strokes are actually in younger uh, people, people under 65. And if we look at the World Health Organization statistics, stroke is the second um, commonest cause of death. And it's actually not far off being the first. Okay, so 11% of all deaths are from stroke. But stroke treatment hasn't really kept 
uh, pace with other treatments. Um, and this is an editorial in the journal Stroke in the early 90s. You know, stroke, stroke is named because it's an event that happens so, supposedly at the stroke of God's hands. And this has been a feeling that's existed until about 15, 20 years ago. It's out of our control. Um, and the, the authors say it's not uncommon to hear non-neurologists and neurologists express the opinion that nothing can be done for a patient with a stroke. So thankfully, a few years later, we had this treatment, intravenous thrombolysis. Um, so go, going back a bit, um, they, they actually tried other agents for stroke, streptokinase, which is successfully used for uh, myocardial infarctions, for heart attacks. That didn't actually work. But in 1995, there's a big landmark trial by the National Institute of Neurological Disorders and Stroke in America, uh, which studied a different agent called recombinant tissue plasminogen activator, RTPA. And that found a definitive benefit of this clot-busting treatment if it's given within three hours of onset of stroke. So, so that was the first trial, and then um, I'm talking about the UK now. So about, about seven years after that, um, the, the regulator here issued a license to use RTPA in the UK after some more trials in the interim. Uh, then in 2007, NICE got around to assessing the cost-effectiveness of RTPA and approved it within three hours. And then the following year, the Royal College of Physicians and English Professional Association um, advocated RTPA in the treatment of acute stroke um, across the country. And what, one other point I want to make from the research that we have is that time is brain. So in stroke thrombolysis, it's crucial that patients are treated early, um, not just within the three hours, but even if you subdivide that three hours, as we've done in these graphs. So, so the graphs here at the bottom, you can see time in 90-minute intervals from the time off stroke. And on the y-axis, you can see the benefit and harm. So the light gray is the benefit, and the dark gray is the harm. So you can see that even within the first three hours, if you do it within the first 90 minutes, there's an even greater benefit. Uh, and as time goes on, there's less and less benefit, and there's more and more harm. And that, that's mainly from the risk of bleeding because of the drug. Uh, and the quote which uh, summarizes that is, each hour in which treatment fails to occur the brain loses as many brain cells as it does in almost 3.6 years of normal aging. So, so it's very important to get there early. So, okay, so um, this sort of uh, may remind you of Helen's first diagram where we looked at research guidelines practice. Um, and you may think, okay, so we had the first trial in 1995, guidelines 2007, so it must be in practice now. And, and conveniently, this adds up, to, adds up to about 18 years. And you may all remember that or know that um, 17 years is supposedly the average time to get uh, any research study into practice. Uh, so is it in practice? Well, sadly, not, actually. So these are quite a few studies, mainly in the US, UK, and Australia. Uh, and they're in chronological order. So at the top, we've got a study in 2000, and at the bottom, a study two years ago. Um, and in those patients who could receive thrombolysis, so they had the right kind of stroke, how many actually did? And if we look at the percentages there, it's actually quite shockingly low, isn't it? I mean, it's not even double digits. So there, there has been an upward trend. So it's gone up from about you know, 2 percent to about 5, 5 6, 7%. Um, but at this rate, it'll probably be another century before everyone gets treated for this. So. People had great expectations. Um, we still do. And how have we tried to improve the uptake of this clot busting treatment for strokes? Well, I think one thing is we need to think about um, the pathway, not as simplistically as the first diagram that Helen showed, but the diagrams that were shown later on. Um, and this is just a different way of showing the same thing. There's lots of other factors involved. Okay, and um, for stroke, there's another uh, way of representing this, which was in a paper two years ago. So this is a pyramid, and we start at the bottom here. So this is everyone who's had a stroke right at the bottom of the pyramid. Um, sorry, I don't have, actually, no, maybe this. Oh, yeah, okay. So this is everyone who has a stroke. And then as you work your way up to the pyramid, uh, up, up the pyramid, that's the proportion that actually receive RTPA, the, the clot busting treatment. So you can see there's barriers all along the patient journey. So firstly, just getting into hospital, only a third of patients get into hospital within three hours. And there's barriers related to patient, barriers related to paramedics. 
then once they get into hospital, only about 1 in 10, 1 in 11 of them make it up to thrombolysis, and there's lots of other barriers there. So there's lack of infrastructure, lack of physician expertise in hospitals. Um, contraindications, okay, so those are medical contraindications. Um, this has been vaguely defined as in-hospital barriers, uh, and physician uncertainty comes up again there. So there's multiple barriers, that's essentially what that shows. Um, and looking at the patient journey horizontally, uh, from the time they have a stroke, patients get an ambulance, go to hospital. Um, what's interesting about stroke is that people need to have a CT scan of their head um, before they can receive the clot busting agent to make sure they haven't had a bleed in their brain, in which case it would be devastating to give them this, this drug. Um, and I'll talk a bit about barriers in each of those parts of the journey. Um, now, what I'm not going to talk about, which Peter will talk about, is actually what happens even before a stroke, the prevention side of it. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that to him. So if I start right at the end, actually giving the drug, what's important to remember, I think, is um, the, the study that we, we talked about earlier uh, was in 1995. But that doesn't mean research has stood still. In the same time that we're trying to implement research, there's more and more data and there's newer drugs coming out. So, so I've just picked two examples of this. So the first study, the IST3 trial up here, um, that was actually testing the same agent, RTPA, as in 1995, but just in different age groups and at different times of onset to see if there was an effect. And that was just last year. So there's still research being done using the uh, treatment from 1995. Um, and then also newer agents. So there's this agent called tenecteplase, uh, which seems to be more effective. Uh, we don't have enough data yet, but it may mean that we could actually um, use thrombolysis after four and a half hours. Uh, and then if we step back a bit, I mentioned that everyone needs a CT scan. Not all doctors can read a CT scan of the head. Not, not everyone knows how to interpret that. Um, especially in rural areas where people may not have access to neurological centers or neurologists or neuroradiologists who can look at those scans. Uh, an interesting study a couple of years ago found that telemedicine or telestroke was just as good as being in a neurological center. And by that, what we mean is you have a specialist who's on that monitor there. Um, this is a patient in a faraway hospital, miles away, uh, and the specialist just watches what the patient's function is, can look at the scan as well, and can say, yes, go ahead with thrombolysis, or don't go ahead with thrombolysis. Um, so that, that was an interesting study that showed we can use technology to uh, increase adoption rates. Another one, um, how about actually getting the scan? Uh, patients may be delayed getting to a CT scanner, particularly out of hours. So are there ways we can reduce that? Well, actually, there's a great study in Germany, this was published just last year, where they use mobile stroke units. So stroke units go to the patient and do the CT scan. And they managed to shave off 40 minutes, which is a massive amount of time, actually, in, in this kind of emergency. Um, so people got their thrombolysis agent just 35 minutes after having their stroke. Uh, and this is what one looks like. So it's a lot like an ambulance, except probably a lot heavier. Um, you can see that at the back there, that's the, that's the CT scanner. So it, I think it only fits the head. Um, and they go around and do the scan and take people to hospital at the same time. So we can go even earlier. What about hospitals themselves, taking people to the right hospital? Um, ironically, actually, London had a bit of a problem with that a few years ago. And I'll show you two maps of London. So this map on the left, um, this was in the mid-2000s. This looks at the prevalence of strokes. So the darker the area, the more strokes that happen there. And you can see that generally more strokes seem to happen around the outskirts of London. And it's probably due to demographic characteristics. Older people tend to be further out um, in the suburbs. But if we look at the hospital services provided for stroke thrombolysis, most of them are concentrated in the middle. So actually, if you had a stroke in the middle of London, there's about 15 hospitals within, a, or there were 15 hospitals within a half an hour journey away. Uh, whereas if you had one on the edges of London, at the gaps, there's one or two, if you're lucky. Okay. So in London, what happened, and there'll be more about this tomorrow. I think Dame Ruth Carnal is talking about the London stroke strategy tomorrow morning. Um, the service was reconfigured completely. So a lot of hospitals that did provide thrombolysis were told not to. And now we have eight centers that are dotted all the way around London to try and cover everyone. And ambulances know to take people to one of these eight centers. Um, and there's clear pathways. Expertise is concentrated in those eight centers now rather than being in every hospital. Um, and, and a lot of these centers, they're called hyperacute stroke units. 
uh, perform very well. So five of the eight are in the top seven in the UK. And they've reduced the time to thrombolysis. And also London outperforms the UK. So this is survival. So the higher up you are, the better you are. So London is the solid line at the top there. Okay. Um, and England is the dotted line at the bottom. And the last barrier I want to talk about is right at the beginning. So we saw on the first pyramid that only about a third of patients make it into hospital. So how do we raise public awareness? How do we get patients to know that if they've had a stroke, they need to call an ambulance? It's an emergency. They need to come in. So nine years ago, there's a study uh, in Newcastle where they thought about simple ways to get people to remember strokes. Um, and it's actually for paramedics initially and then rolled out for the public as well. Uh, and they found this simple four-letter acronym, FAST, F-A-S-T, um, to, to make people remember what a stroke is and what they need to do. Um, there, there have been three advertising campaigns since then. Um, stroke emergency calls have increased 55%. It's been immensely successful. Uh, it's been rolled out worldwide. And I'll show you a few examples of the adverts. So I'm not going to be able to translate them. But, but there's about five adverts, and we'll finish with the UK one. Think fast. Check their face. Does their mouth droop? Can they lift both arms? Is their speech slurred? Do they understand you? Time is critical. If you see any of these signs, call triple zero. When a stroke strikes, the damage spreads like a fire in the brain. To spot the signs of a stroke, you have to think and act fast. F. Face. Has their face fallen on one side? Can they smile? A. Arms. Can they raise both arms and keep them there? S. Speech. Is their speech slurred? T. Time. Just like a fire, it's time to call 999 if you see any single one of these signs. The faster you act, the more of the person you save. When stroke strikes, act fast. So I hope that gives you a flavor of how worldwide the campaign has been. Uh, there's a prize if you recognize all the languages there. Um, so I just want to finish with, if, if Charles Dickens did have a stroke today at his London address, he'd be taken to this hospital, uh, and he may have survived, who knows. Um, and I'll hand over to Peter. Hi. Afternoon. Um, I'm a GP. So I'm a family doctor. I also run one of these new clinical commissioning groups in Medway, which is part of North Kent, which happens to cover the area where Dickens lived. Um, he had a place at Gads Hill in Higham. And what we're going to talk about here is how we actually unlock what's happening in primary care and equally how we can do things to prevent the stroke happening. And I think this is, to me, really interesting, and I think you'll be interested, so stick around. So... Dickens died at 58 of a stroke, and currently we would regard that as a failure of care. How did he come to have a stroke at 58? What have we not done about prevention, early diagnosis? How do we prevent that happening for him? Now, we know that in primary care, and primary care in England is quite good, okay? But even allowing for that, we know that from Marmot, we know that King's Fund, there is lots and lots of variation in terms of what we deliver in primary care. And this is key, if we can improve the quality of primary care and we can improve what people are doing, we will improve the outcomes for patients. We know that in the NHS in England, 90% of contacts happen in primary care. We concentrate a lot on secondary care, but most of the activity is happening in primary care. That's 300 million consultations a year. It's a huge opportunity. 
Now, where are we? Because we've heard a lot about evidence, we've heard a lot about research, getting it into practice and how we make it work. And the problem, as I see it, is it's actually really difficult. As I say, I'm a GP, I work in primary care. Primary care is really difficult. We've got 10 minutes in this country, we spend 10 minutes with a patient. I'm supposed to remember every piece of nice guidance that should apply to that individual at that point in time. It's difficult. I struggle. If you can do it, wonderful. So what have we got at the minute? We've got nice guidelines. Well, they're a bit like an A to Z to me, okay? I don't use an A to Z anymore. I use SatNav. I use something that tells me what I need to know when I need to know it, okay? I don't try and remember it all in my head. And equally, if we're trying to run primary care as a system, we need to have some business intelligence. We need to know what's happening across the whole of the system. Those of you in the uh, big session this morning would have heard about that, you know, 300,000 foot where they've got all the screens, they know what's happening. You need to know what's going on. It's not just about the individual, you need to map it across. So why have we got all this variation going on? Um, and this is where you start thinking. If a system is designed to deliver what the system is delivering, we're delivering a lot of variation. Now, either everybody trying to do the job is doing it badly, or they're trying to do a really good job, which is what I believe they're trying to do, but it's difficult. Okay? In medicine, certainly in this country, we've used this concept of what we call patient unmet needs. So when you see a patient and they come along and they have a query, they have a problem, and you don't know, quite know the answer, you go to research, you look it up, you check the books, you talk to your colleagues, you try and find the answer out so that you know the answer to that patient. That becomes your educational need. But sometimes, even when you know the knowledge, you either forget it when you need it, or you don't apply it, or something else got in the way of you being able to deliver that best care. And that's where you need to improve the system. Now, in this country, and I suspect in a lot of other countries, what we've done about trying to get change is we've concentrated on the driving forces. We've concentrated on the education, the research, the pushing from it. What we've not concentrated on so much is the restraining forces, the things that are preventing us doing what we want to do. And this is from um, Kurt Lewin, force field analysis. This is from the 1950s. It's not new. So how did we set about trying to address this sin of all the variation that we've got so that we can get to a better place? And how will this have prevented Dickens, if he were alive now, having that stroke and dying so young? We looked at what was working. Now, one of the things that we have in this country is a thing called the Quality and Outcomes Framework, which is a payment system introduced into primary care which rewards clinicians for looking after patients depending upon process measures and some outcome measures. And this was put in place um, about sort of seven, eight years ago now probably. And it's interesting because what actually you find is that in the areas that were in the quaff, the quality of care went up slightly more than the areas that weren't in the quaff. But equally, a lot of clinicians delivered care over and above the upper payment threshold. So if they were only motivated by the money to do this, you would have assumed they would have stopped when they stopped being paid. Because everything they did beyond that was charity work. They had to pay their staff, they had to pay their overheads, they got no return from it. So why did they do it? Okay. And that's where you start to thinking. So was it the payment that caused this change in behaviour and the improved care in those conditions, or was it something else? Now, the thing that came in to support Quoth was prompts and decision in the IT system. So within the GP IT systems, they would have little reminders of the things that they needed to do, and they would disappear when you'd done those things for your patients. So you had something that actually helped you do the job. It made it easier to do the job for those patients than it did for the patients where you weren't receiving the prompts. So we then took the decision to sort of say, okay, the payment probably facilitates this, but people are delivering above the payment. So it isn't just the money that's making this work. And clinicians want to do a good job. So was it because by adding prompts in, by giving that support, we made it easier for the clinicians to do a good job, therefore we got more of a good job. So we worked on that. We decided to put prompts in, follow nice guidelines, follow best practice, 
This means that when you see a patient, you get something that suggests what you should be doing for that patient at that point in time. The practice can get a report of all patients who may have missed some follow-up or benefit from an intervention. And at a commissioning group level or an organisation level, you can see who's doing what. So we asked for the guidance to be written. Um, I didn't succeed. So we then found a bit of software that would enable us to do the job. And in this country, the GPIT systems, there are a number of different suppliers, but they all work on a common coding set. And those coding sets are interchangeable. So whether it's read codes or snow made codes, they're interchangeable, so you can get a read across. So what this does is it works on the codes. It doesn't matter which clinical system people are working on. We wrote the audits. The BMJ actually bought this company because they could see how it isn't just about education, it's about getting better care to patients. It's about getting the education and getting the interventions into practice for the benefit of patients. If it doesn't benefit the patient, it's a doorstop. So, one of the things that can cause stroke is atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation has now been put into the quality and outcome framework, so all GPs are now being paid to deliver a standard of care in how they look after patients with atrial fibrillation. This is showing the time it's taken from the initial randomised controlled trial through to the NICE guidance through to current practice. Well, if current practice were perfect, they wouldn't have to start paying GPs to do it. So what do we start thinking about doing? Well, actually, it goes back to the system delivers what the system is designed to deliver. So it's not just do the push, but what can we do about changing the practice? How can we actually change the system? How can we change that to make it deliver more? So what you get, when you see a patient, you get a little view like this. The different systems will have slightly different views, but you've got a view where you have a little box up there and it will give you some prompts and reminders. Now, a lot of people are quite cynical of these prompts because certainly in this country they've become aligned with being paid. Okay. What I want to do is to very much move people's thinking away from that. The prompt should be about the quality of care. The prompt should be there to remind you, this is something I should have considered for this patient based on the information I already know about this patient and already have in their notes. Okay? If they come because their mother's died, I'd probably ignore all of them because it would be completely inappropriate to be doing that at that point in time. Um, we then get views, and I'm sorry the little boxes here don't uh, overlap. We can then do these sorts of views, and this shows you, this is for our whole um, CCG. So we've got a, we're looking at a population here of about 274,000 patients. That's over about 60 practices. And we can then see how many patients have had their pulse rhythm checked in the last year, which is really not very good at the moment. But equally, we can see the number of patients with a CHADS-2 score on warfarin and it's over 70%, which is the target they put into QOF because this wasn't being achieved. We did that in 2011. So how do we do it? How do we get to a point that they want people to now pay people to do? We did that by writing the audit that sits in the back of the system. So when I see a patient who has a CHAD score, 2 score of over 2 in AF who isn't on warfarin, it reminds me, when that patient is in front of me, to consider putting them on warfarin. Okay? Equally, at a practice level, I can pull off a report of all of those patients. Okay? Equally, at a CCG level, I can see what people are doing. So, I've made it easy. You haven't got to go elsewhere, you haven't got to run separate programs. It sits with the bits of software that you're using to look after the patient. They've used tools in the past, like GRASP AF in this country, which you extrapolate data, you look at it, you then have to go back to the patient. It got from about 52% to 54% warfarinization rate. We'd hit 70. And we can see, by practices, we've just blacked out for politeness the names of the practice. We can see how each practice is performing. And we can see the prevalence because the prevalence is really important as well. Now, Medway has a slightly younger age sex profile than the, the national average, so our prevalence is slightly lower than the national average. But clearly, yes, 
it's important to make sure that those people who should be on warfarin are on warfarin, but it's equally important that we've diagnosed them as having AF to begin with. And this helps target support, it helps have the conversations. And we can see that variation, and there's quite a big variation across some of the practices, and we know why some of that is because of the distribution of patients and their age across, but, but equally, we can start having conversations. Some of those practices probably aren't looking hard enough to find those patients. Now, familial health cholesterolemia, we've done loads and loads of health checks. So in the NHS, we have NHS health checks, which start at 40, go to 75. Everyone is called in once every five years. And it's predominantly an assessment to try and decrease cardiovascular mortality. So blood pressure, cholesterol, exercise, weight. But what about the people with familial hypercholesterolemia? Well, if we pick it up at 40, we've missed it. Okay? We looked at the NICE guidance, and the NICE guidance sort of said, all those people with high cholesterol or high LDL cholesterol should be referred through to secondary care. They then should have a genetic test, but by the way, if the genetic test doesn't show anything, treat them anyway. And we sort of said, well, that hasn't worked. I could do you that another little arrow that shows you how long it's taken from um, the idea through to the NICE guidance through to the reality, and it's just not working. Okay? We think the prevalence of familial hypercholesterolemia should be about 0.2 in this country. It's probably higher. The Dutch say it's about 0.5. Um, but this is where we are at the moment. And so what we did is we took it apart and we did it the other way around. I said that within the primary care database, and we've got records going back 20 years across the RCCG, we should, it is very unlikely that anyone has either not personally had a cholesterol done, their relative has had a cholesterol done, or they haven't had a cardiovascular event at a young age. So, probably, we know who all these patients are already, the people at risk. So, when we started this, and this is the, um, so this is sort of fairly up to date, when we started this, we've added about 100 people to either having familial hypercholesterolemia or possible familial hypercholesterolemia. We're not managing them as well as we should do as yet, but we're working that through. But this is the important one here, okay? We've got 1,316 patients currently who have a cholesterol ever of over 7.4 and an LDL of over 4.9, okay? and haven't been assessed against the Simon Broom criteria to know whether they've got familial hypercholesterolemia. We need to assess them. So we're getting some nurses in to come through and have those conversations. And for a lot of those patients, the information would already be in the notes, but it's not been put together. For some of them, it's a telephone call about their family history. For some of them, it needs to get them back in. Now, yes, we need to exclude from this group the people whose uh, cholesterol was up because their thyroid was abnormal or things like that, but we know who to target. Okay? So out of my total population of 275,000, I'm now looking at 1,316. And if you're homozygous for the genetic things, you will have cardiovascular disease in your teens. Okay, this is something that is very, very treatable and very manageable. And yet, we're doing such a bad job at it at the moment. Diabetes. Okay. We do a lot of work on diabetes, and again, diabetics are more likely to have strokes. Okay, we know that. Okay. Equally, we know that we haven't diagnosed all the people out there who've got diabetes. Now, some of that, there is one group of patients that I call the misdiagnosed, where there is data already in the primary care record that suggests this patient has diabetes, but they've not been labelled properly, therefore they're not getting the proper care and proper follow-up. There's another group of patients who we haven't yet diagnosed. Now, the earlier we diagnose people, the earlier we can put the interventions in, the better the outcome's going to be for that individual. So what we then did, and NICE published a piece of guidance um, earlier in the year, well, sorry, end of last year, where it was suggesting that um, we should screen all individuals. And they put something on the Diabetes UK website, which is really useful. An individual can go in, ask your set of questions, and it will tell you your risk of having diabetes. And if your score is above a certain level, it suggests you go and see your GP. We sort of said, well, why are we going to rely on every single individual in the country to go and do that? Why don't we just look at what we already know in the GP database. So that's what we did. So we started off um, looking at 
Now, within the algorithm we've used here, this is, it's also from the Leicester model, and the Leicester model was the one that they've used on Diabetes UK, but this is a variation of it that they've, they've done and they pilot in Leicester. The reason we did that was because the Diabetes UK one wants waist circumference, and I don't know any GP in this country that routinely measures anybody waist circumference. So we decided that was going to be a data gap. So what we've got here is a score that becomes based on their age, their family history, their BMI, whether they're on treatment for hypertension, and their ethnicity. So we've then got a group here, again, so we started our 275,000 population, we've got a group down here of 500 and something patients who have a risk. And from the risk, 10% of those will have diabetes, and about 29% of those will have some form of impaired glucose tolerance. So we can start doing something about them. So we know who to target. Equally, where we got, haven't got all the information, so we haven't got a BMI, or haven't got a family history, or haven't got their ethnicity recorded, what we do is we use the worst case data, put them into the next group, and they also get a prompt to sort of say, consider diabetes, but ask, record their ethnicity or record their body mass index. So we're getting a cleaner data set to make the information. We can target that group of patients now. So what we're really trying to do is to move the whole of the agenda of primary care from being reactive, from waiting for patients who are unwell to come and see us, to being proactive, to try and prevent people becoming unwell to begin with. Um, it fits very much with the sort of the marmots um, agenda from that. And so every pathway that we try and develop in, in our commissioning group starts with how do I prevent this condition? How do I diagnose it earlier? How do I manage it better? So it's far less about what do I do when they get to hospital. That is really important, but it's far more about what can I do to stop them ever needing to go there to begin with. The slides are all online later. So. And this is... <laughs> This is a graph that was in Marmot's first report, and really, I think this is quite... This, this really changed my thinking. You know sometimes people talk about a, a paradigm shift in thinking, okay? This was a paradigm shift in thinking for me. What it's showing you is deprivation across the bottom. So the least deprived on the right-hand side, the most deprived on the left-hand side. And it shows us something that I think we all knew, that the people in the most deprived groups die younger than the people in the least deprived groups. What it also shows on the bottom line is this gap is what they call the disability-free life years. So for all that period of time, these patients are unwell. These patients are actually unwell for a shorter period of time. So what this is suggesting is that actually the people who die youngest are ill for more years than the people who die older. That gives you a very strong, mo both moral argument to address inequalities, the economic argument to address inequalities. So what do we start doing in terms of populations? Okay, so we started to sort of do smoking. Now smoking probably is fairly routinely monitored in primary care in the UK and a lot of other countries. Um, we've got the two lines. The lower line is the... Um, average percentage across the whole CGG of the patients that we had smoking status recorded on as at the 1st of November 10, the top line is the 1st of April 2013. Now what I can tell you is that difference is actually about 31,000 patients who we've added, we know the smoking status, and this is the smoking status within the last 27 months. So it's got to be, for any smoker, it's got to be current. Okay. Equally, so I've got information on an extra 30 odd thousand patients, 2,421 fewer patients smoke in 2013 than in 2010 on that data set. So not only have we increased the recording, but we know that fewer patients smoke. Every patient that smokes, there's a little prompt. It says, talk to them about smoking. It's every time they come through the door. Now, this isn't about nanny state. This isn't about telling people what they must do, but it's about having a conversation with people. I don't believe people choose to smoke because they want to get lung cancer. 
They choose to smoke because they find some pleasure from it. It fits with their peer group. There are many reasons why they choose to smoke. But equally, there will be reasons why they choose to stop smoking at some point. And so it's finding those opportunities and giving them those opportunities to change. And that's really what we're sort of trying to do with some of that. Equally in terms of looking at people's body mass index, again, we've seen improvements in their recording rates. But this isn't about weighing people who are overweight. Okay? This is about knowing people's weight. This is about knowing that somebody like me is a bit borderline. So the next time I go down and I'm a bit the wrong side of borderline, it triggers a conversation because hopefully I'm young enough, fit enough, active enough to modify my lifestyle. When my BMI gets to 50 and my knees are shot with arthritis, it, it's really, really difficult. If we can do something much earlier, we can get some benefit from it. And equally within this audit, we'll know not only who's got a normal weight, who's overweight, who's underweight, who's obese, but for that group of people who are overweight, we then look at their ethnicity and their waist circumference and work out their risk. Because it doesn't follow that just because you're overweight you're at increased risk. You need to look at the ethnicity and the waist circumference. Some of those people, rugby players, are often at no increased risk. Their BMI is big, but their waists are relatively small, their risk is not high. We do alcohol screening as well. So we ask people the audit C, the audit questionnaire, the FAST questionnaire. It's just in there. Okay? These prompts come up for people who haven't been asked in the last 27 months. My GPs can choose to ask it or not ask it. I'm not paying them to do any of this. I am enabling them to do things that they might want to do because it is beneficial to their patient. And also because people who are overweight consult more often. People who drink excessively consult more often. People who smoke consult more often. So if we can reduce some of those things, you actually reduce the workload on primary care. There was a paper in the BMJ earlier in the year which suggested that purely asking people about their alcohol status, uh, using the audit questionnaires, did decrease the amount of alcohol that some people consumed. Um, now we estimate, if you um, extrapolate it from that paper upwards, we would have decreased the alcohol consumption in Medway by 0.6%. I don't know whether it's true or not, but it's interesting. So what else can we use this approach for? Um, and really we're trying to turn it around. Now, um, Willie Hamilton and Julia Hipsley-Cox. Julia Hipsley-Cox is from Nottingham. She does a lot of the Q-risk algorithms. Um, Willie Hamilton's done some research there in Exeter, and what they've done is they've both retrospectively gone through big swathes of GP databases and said, if you have this combination of symptoms, you're more likely to have cancer than if you don't have that combination of symptoms. And they said so they risk scored it, okay? which is great. But we don't want to do it on every single individual individually. What we want to do is systematically embed it within the systems so that it tells me who's at risk. So this is a piece of research that's now being taken forward by um, the Department of Health, funded by Macmillan Cancer Care, who are trying to see whether this will work prospectively. You know, it's really interesting to know the retrospective data, but will knowing that be able, enable us to do something different going forward? So when they get a slightly higher score, it comes up on my screen to consider that as a possible diagnosis in that patient. Um, it will need some refining and working through. Equally, because we can put the prompts and the audits into systems, we can do niche audits. COF will only cover big areas of medicine, diabetes, hypertension. When you've got really small disease areas where you may only have one or two patients in your practice, it just doesn't fit with that COF model. But putting the prompts in to remind you what you should do and being able to run a report to see whether you've done it very much fits with providing better quality care. So we can start writing these things for the more, um, as I say, niche audits for, for rarer conditions. But those conditions are really important to every single person who's got them. Um, and we can do the formulas. One of the things that we did when we wrote the AF audit was we did the maths. Um, we told you what the, what the CHADS 2 score was. We didn't say, this person's got AF, please calculate a CHADS 2 score. 
We said the result of this score is, now do something about it. Um, computers are good at doing that. Humans have got to first sit there and say, right, the C stands for, yep, sorry, yeah, congestive cardiac failure, and work all your way through, and then remember the scoring system, and then remember that it's got to be greater than or equal to two before you put the intervention in. Computers are good at that. I'm not. So what else can we do? Screening. Okay, we do aneurysm screening in this country. We call in all men at 60. Okay? The people are really at risk of having aortic aneurysms are the people with smoking, diabetes, heart disease. So all the group of patients we exclude from having a health check, because we should be looking after them already, are actually the high risk group for having an aneurysm. So if we ran this through primary care, we can pick up the high risk people. So we can start to target them. We can send them letters, we can text them, we can do things. Health checks, again, because we've got the primary care database, we can work out who needs a health check, who doesn't need a health check. Um, screening programs, they run independent of primary care. Now, why don't I get a prompt on my little desk that says, oh, you, missed, you, you missed your last screening, you, you didn't go for your breast screening. Now, I am that person's GP. Okay? There is a strong evidence that I, as that person's GP, or any other GP as that person's GP, is a bigger influencer than a letter coming through their doormat from somebody they've never heard of before. Okay? So why aren't we doing it together? Why aren't we getting the results in when it says DNA'd, right, puts a prompt up straight away, fine, next time I see them I can talk to them about it. Or I could send them a letter. Okay. We do some productivity stuff because of course we can analyse the whole of the GP database. So they want a submission for the National Diabetes Audit, we've got 100% return. Um, immunisation returns, just don't do it manually, let the computers do the work, that's what they're good for. I want to concentrate on the patient. Other things we can do, okay, we all get reports that sort of say this drug has come out, you need to review all the patients on particular drug or brand X or whatever else. What I tend to do is, I mean, it comes electronically to me now, which is much better than getting it on a piece of paper, but actually, wouldn't it be wonderful, actually, if my computer suddenly told me, yes, and these are the three patients that are on it that you need to talk to. And I could then auto-generate a letter to go out to them, or I could pick the phone up, or I could do something. There's a module, we can do that now. Okay. The next bit, we talk about um, medication. Okay. There are a huge number of medication errors. There's a huge number of people who end up in hospital due to adverse drug reactions, interactions, or things like that. Okay? And most of the systems at the minute are no better than the BNF because they tell you what's in the BNF or they tell you what's in the data bank, which is to say, consider this drug in people with renal failure, liver, blah, blah, blah. But what they're not sort of saying is, Mrs. Jones is sat in front of you, she's 86 and her renal function is this and her blood pressure is that and she's already on these medications. Do not prescribe this drug to her. So where it can start telling me that, do not prescribe this drug because of their kidney function. And equally, next week when I get her results back and her kidney function is dropped, it reminds me to say, consider changing that medication, consider reducing the dose, consider doing something about it. So it's starting to sort of inform my decision making, rather than me have to sort of, you know, it's difficult enough as it is, let's make it easier. So, what do we try to do? We try to really, rather than just throw data into these primary care databases, we try to use that data so that we can target care, we can provide better care, we can use it um, to help patients care at the right time for the right individual. The practices can do reports. We as a commissioning organisation that are trying to help um, practices deliver better care can target support, can target resources. And we start to systematically address some of those sort of public health issues. And it is, it's smarter, not harder. I'm not asking anyone to work any harder. What I'm trying to do is to say, if we use the computers, we can help you work smarter. And if you're only going to do one thing, make sure it's the right thing. And there's 300 million consultations, so we haven't got to get them all changed. You know, even if we've got 1%. It's a huge, huge difference. Um, and it's that a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and a little bit and it makes a difference. 
So where have we got to? We think we've moved on from that. We think we now have something that does clinical decision support. You know, it's not perfect. There are lots of areas that we need to develop. There's lots of things we need to do. But equally, we've got some support at a system level where we can see what individual practices are doing in a supportive way. This is not about telling people off. This is about helping people do the job they want to do, which is look after patients. Now, I can't show cause and effect. Okay? I don't do, I, what I do might have a bit of sort of action research flavour to it, but I actually I don't do it as pure research. Everything I think of that will make a difference, I try and make sure it happens. And not just in my practice as me with my patient, but in my GP practice and across the CCG and then going bigger. But what we can see is that if we look at that top, um, this is the standardised admission ratio for cardiovascular disease across Medway from 2006. And what you can see is it's coming down. So if Dickens were alive, he'd have less chance of having a stroke now than previously. Now I can't tell you which of those interventions might have made that difference, but something's working. Okay, if it were going the other way, I would be seriously worried. And the same way as we had the FAST campaign, this is something, it's quite, when we put this presentation together, I didn't know Krishna was going to do his Dickens bit, and he didn't know that Dickens lived in High and was part of our area, and he didn't know I dreamt this up one Friday afternoon, and we were waiting for our CCG to launch, so the CCG gets the credit for doing this. But what we're trying to do here is a campaign about checking your pulse to see if you've got an arrhythmia, because we know that AF causes a lot of strokes, and we know that they're preventable. Okay? But we know that a lot of people haven't diagnosed them. So actually, if we can encourage people to check their own pulse, or to check the pulse of somebody they care about, it'll help. Okay? We've not field tested it or anything. We just think it's a good idea, and if you want to use it, fine, use it. It's what it's there for. What we're suggesting is you do it one month before somebody's birthday. Okay? Never pick Christmas Day, the system will crash. You've got to spread it over the year. Don't do it on their birthday, you might spoil their birthday. Do it one month before when you think about getting them a card, you think about buying them a present, go and see Granny, take a pulse, make sure it's normal. Okay? The links on there show you how to take a pulse. You will all know how to do it, but it's quite simple. It's teaching patients how to do it. It's empowering patients to be able to look after themselves. And it's a bit about the, the phrase this morning, it's care with, not care for. And so this is Dickens' house in Kent, in Higham, Gads Hill, and what we would hope that is if he lived now, he wouldn't have needed his thrombolysis. He'd be 101, so he'd be doing quite well. Um, even if we were born a century later. So, um, thank you very much. Okay, um, has anyone got any questions? Um, raise your hand and I think we'll get a mic to you. Yes, there's one just there. Firstly, I would like to thank you for a nice presentation uh, and apologize for my bad English language. I'm from Iraq, a clinical pharmacist and university lecturer. Uh, my question concerning Sutrak, the, sorry, I didn't uh, recognize his name, the guy in the middle. Okay? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> concerning uh, your information, I don't know if I'm right or not. I'm really disappointed because your information said that, that uh, concerning the regional distribution of hospitals in London and the time needed to diagnose the stroke, I think still the problem is existing, okay, for treating stroke, and uh, I think it, it is, I don't know if it is uh, not more than 10% the percentage of uh, staying alive, and if Charles Dickens still alive, I think if he gets stroke now, he will die again. <laughs> <laughs> Concerning information, I don't know. Okay? And uh, another question, if you don't mind, what about something I heard about the Chinese pins or something like that uh, uh, after the stroke, uh, if you make uh, 
a little puncture in the ear or something, it's, uh, it's better for the patient to, to, get, to be alive or something like that. And thank you very much. Okay. Um, so to take the second question first, I have no idea what that treatment is. There, there may well be. What, I mean, what I do know is, that, again, I didn't mention it on the slides, but there are advances like intra-arterial thrombolysis. So, for example, people threading a catheter up and injecting a drug straight into the artery which has the clot. Um, and that, that's quite promising. But again, this needs more resources, and it's going to be even more difficult to implement than, than straightforward intravenous thrombolysis, which is just into someone's arm. Um, the first question. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so it sounds like Dickens had quite a severe stroke. I don't know. But in London, the reconfiguration, and you'll hear more about it from the person who actually led the reconfiguration tomorrow morning, uh, certainly has improved it. So I, I work in one of the eight hyperacute stroke units, and we have seen a big decrease in the time to thrombolysis. So the moment patients come into hospital uh, through the A&D door, to when they actually get the agent, it, it's significantly decreased, and we're auditing that all the time. I mean, in, in one hospital in London, there's actually a nurse who has a stopwatch with her, and she starts it every time a patient comes. And so you're always thinking, okay, I need to think about the time. Um, so I think, I think stroke care has definitely improved in London. Okay. Thanks so much. Great. Are there any other questions from the crowd? Is there anyone who'd like to share some experiences with us? Um, or, the, or I thought there were quite a few opportunities where um, we looked at a range of different things. Got a question coming up? Uh, yes. Thank you. Hi, my Hi. name's David Nicol. I'm a neurologist, and I was thinking about the stroke analogy because I've been involved in RCTs to do with epilepsy, RCTs to do with Parkinson's disease, and RCTs to do with stroke. And stroke, far and away, was the hardest one. Uh, and the reason, because it involves the whole pathway from primary care to diagnostics. And I just wonder what the panel think about how one motivates change when there's so many blocks in the system. I mean, for example, I was interested in IST3, uh, one of the thrombolysis trials. It took five years for my interest to actually get a patient randomised into it. And part of that was trying to get the radiologist that, you know, they need to have a scan. You need to think of having a scan like a chest X-ray now. And, you know, uh, and you don't have those problems with those other diseases. So just some thoughts on the panel about how you motivate change. Thanks. Um, I think maybe it's important to start in primary care and talk about prevention and your challenges and then move through. Would that be a good way of doing it? How do you motivate people to change their practice? Okay. I mean, I, I'm going to answer it from both ends because although I'm a primary care physician, I think that the approach we're trying to do in getting the change in primary care is make it easier. Don't just lecture people, don't just tell people, make it easier for them to do a good job and you'll get more of a good job. So that's the sort of approach that we're trying to take very much with our clinicians. And, you know, I've got 60 odd practices in Medway. Medway is a slightly deprived area of North Kent. It's not a centre of excellence. And so I've got people coming along and buying into this to a greater or lesser extent because it's easier for them to do it. And they can see how it helps their patients, which is what they want to do, and they can see how actually it makes their life easier, which works for them as well. In terms of the hospital side of things, and as a commissioner for a commissioning group, one of the conversations we're having with our hospitals is about is about margin, okay? So if you get the quality right, often you get the care right. And if you get the care right, you beat the payment system. So you get more margin on your income. We can't, we, we're not in a situation in this country where financially, and I think most other countries, where we can put more money into health systems. It's being there's more money going in but it's less than previously so we've got to operate better we've got to work better and that's about being more productive and so helping hospitals do things where actually doing the right thing is more productive <coughs> so it helps the patient and it helps the finances for the hospital ticks both the boxes your finance director will want to do it um, if it saves him money your finance director <coughs> will want to do it so it's getting the quality to drive the care, I think that's the way you do it. 
Um, I'd agree with that. I think my instinctive reaction is I think data can drive improvement. So, um, you know, the, the data on the low uptake of thrombolysis or the time to thrombolysis, the mean for each hospital, for example, I think that forces people to uh, improve their game. They, they, they can also look at the best performance and go and see what they do, uh, look at the pathways there. So th this is just purely in hospitals I'm talking about. Um, but David, you're probably much more of an expert on stroke than I am. So do you have any ideas yourself? Good, good. Uh, good. That's a good question. Yes. I, it's almost um, a good tip, I think, is thinking how other people perceive you. Okay? So I'm a neurologist. I don't know how many other neurologists in this room, but I can't imagine there's many. Okay? Um, and it's trying to look at how other people view you and be prepared to get your hands dirty. Okay? Uh, I think if you're prepared to get your hands dirty, then people are more likely to, to help you. Um, so that, for me, that meant you know going down to A and E to explain to them uh, that actually neurology is not as difficult as they think it is to try and get around that neurophobia. Um, so it's kind of doing those kind of steps, I think, to try and get people engaged. Uh, and then with my neurological colleagues that weren't interested, mm. <laughs> um, explain to them that I needed their help, um, and we've had to reconfigure services in Birmingham. Um, and that meant that those people who weren't involved with stroke had to help out with, uh, you know, non-stroke activity. Great. Um, I think I'd just add to that as well. I think data and transparency is very important. And I think transparency of data is something that's talked about in the research area quite a lot. But we've seen examples here today where we know that just showing people some figures can actually motivate them and change their behaviour, showing them if they're at the bottom of the curve or the top of the curve, showing them what an intervention has does actually change professional behaviour, and that's an area we can all do a lot more with, I think. Are there any, are there any more questions? In which case, thank you very much.